Hi, thanks for having me today. I'm super excited to see real faces in person. I do miss that a lot. Um, my office is also working largely remotely, but um, it's nice to get back on campus and see folks every once in a while. So thanks for having me here. Um, like Joyce said, I am the director of the HRPP at IU. Um, so that includes the IRB office and our quality improvement office. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. I've been here for about 13, 12 or 13 years. I should know that off the top of my head, but the math gets hard at some point. So um, before I started in the IRB office, though, I had no background or experience in research. So those 12 years have really been in the IRB office, and that's where I have learned and um, grown and gotten my experience in this world. So I am going to talk about a pretty wide variety, a hodgepodge of things today um, based on some of the questions I got. So it might feel a little disjointed, but it's really trying to hit on some kind of hot topics and questions that you guys had. Please interrupt me anytime with questions um, that come in on the chat or here in the room. I don't need to wait till the end at all. Um, please feel free to interrupt anytime. Okay. So let's see if I can get my slides to advance. And there we go. Okay, so a little bit about the HRPP. We are housed in the Office of Research Compliance at IU. That reports up to the Vice President for Research at IU, Fred Kate. And then Fred reports up to the President. So we are university-wide. We don't serve any particular campus. Um, we include both the Human Subjects Office and the Quality Improvement Office. So the Human Subjects Office is the office that supports the IRBs. So if you're submitting IRB applications, those are all the folks that you work with to get those in front of the board for a review. They also do reliance requests. So we, we have heard a lot in the last five years or so about external IRBs and single IRBs and central IRBs. All of the folks that process those on the IU side also work in the human subjects office. Um, also, IU does service the central IRB or the single IRB for some trials. So when we are serving in that capacity, those also go through our office and are handled by our reliance team. Fabulous, just two people in that little tiny department, but they're wonderful. Um, we also have the quality improvement office within the HRPP. That is where our auditors live. So if you've had a visit from Christy or Lisa or Neela, they are all in the quality improvement office. Kara also does um, audits of minimal risk studies. That's a relatively newer program for us. I think it started in about 2019. So before that point, we just went out and audited greater than minimal risk studies, but we've expanded our scope since then. Also in the quality improvement office is ct.gov compliance. and um, also, our auditors look at some research billing compliance. We work really closely with the IU Office for Clinical Research on the billing compliance piece and look at some of that. We have about 30 staff in our office, give or take. Um, and the backgrounds are a wide variety. Um, a few of us, maybe, I don't know, seven or so, like me, came from a law background. Um, I practiced before I started working in the IRB office. I was a practicing attorney in Chicago. Um, many of the folks in our office weren't, though. They were smarter than me, and they went through law school knowing they didn't want to practice and knowing they wanted to do compliance. So they came right into that setting out of uh, law school. Um, we also have a lot of people who have degrees like MPHs and have done um, some work in that realm. Some of them, you know, worked out in the field and then came to work in our office again. Some of them came straight from school. A lot of people have a bit of a science background, um, usually an undergrad in some sort of a science discipline. I don't. I was an undergrad in psychology and business. So um, it's really a wide variety of folks that work in our office, particularly in our quality improvement office. The folks that do the auditing, they have a background more in research. So our two prime auditors, they worked for years and years and years as research board on FDA regulated studies have that on the ground experience. But most of the folks in our human subjects office are really just regulatory experts and haven't necessarily worked on the ground doing research. So what's our mission in the HRPP? We try to live by these things, but you know, it can sometimes be hard because you get down in you know, what you're doing every day and kind of lose sight of what your actual mission is. So I always like to include this when I'm talking about the HRPP broadly, but really everything we do is about protecting human subjects and research. That should be our overriding goal. The regulations tell us how to do that and tell us the boxes we have to check to get there. But really we should be thinking with every submission, with everything we do, every person in my office about protecting the human subjects that are participating in research. So of course, as part of that, we ensure compliance with the federal regulations and with institutional policies. We also try to go out and talk to people. You know, it's, it's easy for us to kind of sit in our 
offices or in our home offices nowadays and um, tell people what to do, tell them what they're doing wrong. And we don't want our office to be that type of a compliance office. We really want to look at ourselves as partners with the research community and helping researchers to know what to do and how to do it more efficiently, more effectively, and more ethically. So, you know, we really want to be problem solvers and a part of the process and work with people. So if you're ever working with anyone in our office and that's not the vibe you're getting, talk to one of us, talk to somebody in leadership in our office, because it's super important. It's something we talk about with our staff all the time that we really want to take that collaborative approach. And some of that is getting out and talking to people, you know, now that we can get out and talk to people again. And you've probably seen me on Zoom, or maybe you've seen me on Zoom. We do a lot of Zoom stuff now as well to kind of get out there and talk to the research community. Um, we also try to be um, innovative. We try to be up with the times, right? Um, you know, some IRBs and HRPP programs are really kind of traditional and cautious. That's not our approach. We want to be innovative. We want to be pushing the envelope. We want to be saying, what are we doing or what have we done for the last 10 years that doesn't actually serve us well, that doesn't serve that human protections purpose? And why do we keep doing it? Is there a way we can stop doing that? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is this is really important to the institution. We need to collect this information for another reason that isn't human subjects protection. But we want to be asking those questions and kind of making sure that we're doing things in a progressive, innovative way. Okay, so who do we serve? As I already mentioned, we serve all eight campuses of IU. We are a university-wide office, and we also serve the many affiliates of IU, particularly the affiliates of the School of Medicine. So you guys, of course, um, Radabush, VA, Eskenazi, IU Health, those are our biggest customers, if you will. So all of the research that happens at those facilities comes through our office, either as a reliance request, if they're gonna use an external IRB, or it comes to our IRB for review and approval. So in serving all of those institutions, we have about 6,500 active studies right now um, across you know, all sorts of uh, levels of review. And about 800 of those 6,500 are under the oversight of an external IRB. If you go back to the days when I started in this office, we did have external IRBs. We had WERB, um, there were a couple smaller ones. We had NCIC IRB, but our number was probably like, 100, 120. So it has really kind of grown and skyrocketed a lot um, over the last 10 years or so. I um, mean, most of our research is minimal risk. You know, that's a big number, but a lot of the research that's happening, there's a lot of student projects down in Bloomington. There's a lot of student projects. There's a lot of dissertations. There's a lot of chart reviews that medical residents do. So a lot of these studies are minimal risk. So about 5,000 of those are minimal risk studies with the other 1,500. That seems a little high right now, actually. I think it's probably closer to 1,200 are greater than minimal risk. About 60% of our research is biomedical and about 40% we classify as social, behavioral, or educational. The way that we classify that is based on the department that it's coming from, not based on the nature of the research procedures or the subjects of the research question. It really is based around the unit or the uh, PI that's conducting that research and what their background is. Um, and about 60% of our research has no external funding. So, um, you know, you hear a lot about the big studies and the funded studies. And of course, they're important. They keep our institution running. They keep my office running. Um, but a lot of what we look at doesn't have any external funding. It really is, you know, just a local project or a collaboration between maybe two institutions and doesn't really have any um, backing. So it's not going through ORA. It's just coming through our office if it doesn't have any external funding. So what are we doing these days? What are people in the IRB world talking about? Um, what are we trying to get done? Um, we recently just completed a project around transnational research. We really wanted to make sure that we weren't over reviewing that. So we have a, I use a strong partnership with Moy University in Kenya, and that was kind of the impetus for this. Historically, we've done essentially a dual review. That research gets reviewed by Moy University in Kenya. It also got reviewed here. And we said, gosh, we feel like we're wasting a lot of people's time, including our time. <laughs> I don't want to waste our time. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that the level of review we were doing was absolutely required by the federal regulations. So we really scaled back our review on these studies in the last few months. We pushed that information out to the research teams that do most of that research. Um, so they're more aware of it. But that's an example of the kind of things that we're trying to do. You know, even when it's small and it impacts just a small pocket of our researchers, we really want to be kind of reducing those inefficiencies. 
Um, another thing that we're getting ready to really launch, it's really been a project that's been ongoing for about three, four years now, but we've been working on consent. So, you know, I, I made a big deal about protecting human subjects is our job and it's what we think about. And we really focus in on the consent. If you sent a consent to the full board and it's gotten reviewed, you have probably gotten back requests for revisions. We'd spend a lot of time focusing on that language. We spend a lot of time in angst over, are we focusing too much on it? Are we focusing too little on it? What can we do? There's this 35 page clinical trial consent. Who does that serve? You know, are we really, a lot of people say it's there to protect the institution. Well, that's not our job. We're not here to protect the institution. So if we're kind of promoting that process for consent and that look of a consent document, are we really doing our jobs the best we can? So um, the new common rule really kind of spurred us along on this that came out in 2018 and said, you have to have a concise presentation of the key information that subjects need. Nobody knew what to do with that. We did a pilot project at the time, um, and we had a few of our staff partner with some study teams and create some really amazing, concise presentations. They were like visual, they had colors and charts, and they were at the first page of the consent. They were awesome. And then we said, look at this awesome work we did, and we didn't have any way to kind of scale it. At that time, we thought, okay, if we give people these examples and we say, this is what we love, you know, we don't want to see this, you know, block of text. So that's just how it's always been done, but that's not the way it needs to be done. That people would kind of pick that up and say, oh, great, this is really cool. I want to do something with this. And I think people said, oh, great, this is really cool. That'd be great if I could do something with this, but I have a lot of other priorities in my work life. And this is just not on that list. I don't have the time, the resources, the expertise, the energy to do this, even if I think it needs to be done. So that was kind of, you know, a few years ago, the point we got to, then the pandemic happened and, you know, nothing really happened in all of our lives in terms of changing things. And now we're back to this. And our idea now is how can we scale this? How can our office get engaged in this? Because I do have capacity. I can create capacity in our office by eliminating some of these things that are less value added and dedicate some of our staff to working with study teams on this. So we are just getting ready to launch this. If you are like, this sounds amazing, I would love for the human subject staff to write my consents for me and make them better talk to me. We'd love to have you participate in it. Um, but it's, you know, something that we're really trying to do to kind of, again, partner with the research community and serve that mission of better protecting human subjects and doing better with consent. Because we think that's what matters, is making sure that people know what they're signing up for when they sign up for a research study. Um, we're also continuing to focus on external IRBs and reliance. That's only growing and will only continue to grow. Um, my next point there is that the FDA just released their notice of proposed rulemaking to come into harmony with the common rule changes. We've been awaiting that for years and years and years. They dropped it last week. I actually haven't read it yet. I shouldn't say that on a recorded video, but um, we'll be doing a lot of work around what that looks like. And it will, we will see an increase to single IRB because whatever the FDA publishes will have some component of an increased requirement for the use of single IRBs, so it will only continue to grow. So we're always looking at those processes across the IRB industry, across institutions. This is a rapidly evolving area, and so we try to stay up on what everybody's doing and what kind of the most efficient processes are so that we can try we can't achieve it, but we can try to align our processes to the extent possible with other institutions and with what other folks are doing so we can make it as streamlined as possible because that is, it's a really complex area for researchers, you know. It's one thing when you had to kind of know the IRB regulations and deal with one IRB. Now, if you have to deal with three, five, 25 different IRBs, that's nearly impossible. So we're really kind of trying to look at what we can do to kind of help researchers and educate people and make it an easier process. So that's an ongoing project for us. I already mentioned the FDA and their changes. Um, we don't know the timeline on that. So if that's your question, we don't know. The comment period ends at the end of November, and then we'll see you know, what they do with those comments and what the implementation period looks like. Um, we're also returning to flexibility. I don't know if this is something that you guys are necessarily even quite conscious of, but um, several years ago, let's say five, seven years ago, we implemented some processes for um, things that were not federally regulated, not FDA regulated, not federally funded. Um, things that, again, in the regulations, we didn't think added value. 
we changed our rules for stuff that did not fall under those categories. So that's where, if you remember the two year approvals once upon a time that we had for studies, that was an example of flexibility. The federal regulation said everything needs a one year approval. We said, well, we're gonna do two year approvals. Then the common rule came and they were like, two year approvals, you don't need renewals at all for those studies. We were like, that's great. So the common rule achieved some of those things. So we dropped flexibility when we implemented the common rule. But now that we're three years or so out from that, we're seeing some new areas where we think flexibility would be really helpful. So we're going to implement some new exempt categories, some new expedited categories um, for research, again, not federally funded, not FDA regulated. So um, you can expect to see that coming in the next six months or so. So that's some of what we're doing these days. Okay, so the first question that people always need to know when they're working with our office is when is IRB approval needed? So IRB approval is needed if it's a systematic investigation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. So that's where if you do a single patient case study, it's not a systematic investigation and it's probably not intended to contribute to generalizable knowledge. It's about a single person. Um, and you have to have a living individual about whom you're either collecting information, identifiable private information, or you're interacting or intervening with them. So the reason I'm like spending time on this, you're like, well, this is like so dry and like silly. But I think that this is the definition that you want to think about when you're using data. You know, this is what drives us to whether IRB approval is needed when you're looking at a study that just involves data, particularly secondary use of data. The question will be, do you have a living individual or a group of living individuals about whom you are, the researcher is collecting identifiable private information? If you don't have that, the secondary use of that data does not need to come to my office at all for review. So that's the trigger for secondary use. Um, now this slide says IRB review is required. So I have a little like asterisk caveat at the bottom. If the research is exempt, you don't have to have IRB approval. Exempt is a weird word. If you haven't heard somebody talk about this before, it doesn't mean it's exempt from the need for review and approval by our office. The term comes from the fact that it's exempt from most of the regulations in that section. So you get to kind of stop at the top. It's determined exempt by our office. And then you don't have to apply the regulations around informed consent, around waiver, around vulnerable populations for the most part. Um, it's exempt from all of those extra regulations. So that's where it comes from. So exempt research, um, just to really quickly go through it because it's gonna drive some of the things that we're gonna talk about on the next slide. Um, most research in educational settings on normal educational practices, that's exempt. Um, surveys, interviews, focus groups, I did not put of adults, that's an important one, of adults on there. You cannot survey kids and be exempt. Um, although under flexibility, that is one of the things that we will change, we will add that in so that that, that, that can be exempt. Um, secondary use of specimens provided no identifiable information is recorded in the research record. Again, you have to access identifiable information though. So if no identifiable information is ever attached to those specimens that the researcher could ever have access to, it's non-human subjects research. So this is just where you have access to identifiers associated with the specimens, but in your research record, you're not gonna record any of those identifiers. So pretty kind of narrow use case. Um, and then secondary use of data. That's the biggest category of exempt research that we see here at IU. Um, it can be exempt if it's either subject to HIPAA, the data is subject to HIPAA, or if no identifiers are recorded in the research record, or if the data is publicly available. So that first bullet is the one that we see the vast majority of our secondary uh, use of data research fall into. So in terms of requirements for review, if it's human subjects research and it's not exempt, so it doesn't fall into one of those categories on that last slide, have to have prospective IRB review and approval and prospective IRB re review and approval of every change to the research before it can be implemented. Sometimes people are like, but my change is really dumb. Like I had a typo on my flyer. My phone number changed, the coordinator's name changed. I want them to call the PI instead of the coordinator. Every one of those changes requires prospective IRB review and approval. One of the things that our auditors see a lot is people think, I'm just going to stop doing this. You know, I said I was going to do these five questionnaires when I submitted my study to the IRB, but I really don't need that fifth one. It's taking the subjects a long time and then they're not loving completing that. I'm just going to drop that questionnaire. No big deal. The IRB doesn't care. They approved me to do it. You know, they don't care that I'm not going to do it. It's just a questionnaire. Wrong. Sorry. I know it seems like um, overburdening you, but that's one of those regulatory things that we don't have a choice in the matter. So even if you're gonna drop a procedure, 
on a study that is not exempt, that requires IRB review and approval before you can drop that procedure. Of course, if there's, you know, risk to people, you know, you find out that something is harmful, somebody's coming in the next day, we don't want you to do that thing to people. You know, we're reasonable people, call us, we'll tell you what to do in that situation. Um, if it's exempt, the rules are different. You still have to have prospective review and approval. It's not by the IRB technically, but that's kind of an unimportant distinction because it still comes through my office and looks the same when the approval comes to you. Um, but changes are only required if they're determined to be substantive. So for exempt studies, that's one of the major advantages. And one of the major advantages of pushing stuff down to exempt if we can is you can make changes to that research and it's not necessarily going to need review and approval by our office again before you can implement that change. So what's the substantive change? I won't go through it all. There's a guidance document on our website. If you ever have questions, you can check that out. You can call one of us. We're happy to talk about it. But one thing that's important to know is um, when you are doing those chart review type studies, those secondary data use studies, and you have a waiver of authorization, we're going to talk more about that in a second. If you're changing the data points to be collected, if you're collecting a new data point, that is a substantive change because the HIPAA waiver documentation is required to include that information. So if we sent you an approval that says you're going to collect date of admission, date of discharge, date of birth, MRN, and diagnosis, and you decide, oh, I put all those dates in there. I meant to say date of death. I didn't list that. And you're like, but that's not a substantive change. I already told the IRB I'm doing a chart review, same patients, you know, same type of thing. It's just this one extra date that is considered a substantive change and does need um, submission of an amendment to our office so that we can reissue that waiver, that approval for the waiver so that you can collect that additional data point. Yeah. Yes. Iterative, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So for folks on uh, camera that might not have heard, the question was, can I talk a little bit about review of amendments for um, changes in qualitative research, particularly because of the iterative design and nature of that? Um, yes, that is hard um, because we want to, you know, we're stuck with the regulations that say, you know, typically this research is going to be expedited. So let's assume it's not just a survey or an interview. If it's just a survey or an interview and that's all you're doing, no problem. You know, you can change those questions as long as you're asking the same general nature of question to folks. We would consider that not substantive and not to require review and approval. However, let's assume we're in the expedited category of review because you're doing some other procedures with people. So in that case, we are trying to get more flexible is the best way to say it. So under the regulations, what requires review and approval are informed consent documents and recruitment materials. Those are the things that are specified. It does not say patient facing materials, which is what you commonly hear that the IRB needs to see anything that's subject facing. That is uh, practice or policy of IRBs that is not in the regulation. So we are moving away from that. So if you have a situation where you've you know, sent us you know, subject diaries and thank you letters and newsletters and things like that, you may be able to cut down on some of your IRB submissions, talk to one of us so you can understand the nuance of where something like a newsletter might cross into recruitment because we want to be careful about that. But if it doesn't fall into those categories, then we do not necessarily have to review and approve every change to that document. So, but we have to set it up right in the beginning. So you have to tell us, you know, I'm going to be doing an interview. These are the general topics that I'm going to ask people about. However, as the study continues, we're going to change these questions as we learn more. They're still going to be in this general framework. The interview is still going to take about 30 or about 45 minutes because we want to know how long it's going to take. That's important for the consent. But if you set it up that way in the beginning, we are likely to approve it. And that's likely to free you from the need for additional amendments. Now, if you submit it and say, we are asking people these questions, period, then you're not in compliance with your IRB submission anymore and your approval and you're kind of stuck in the position. We have not done a good job of getting out and talking about that because that's something we've really just started thinking about more critically in the last eight months to a year, but um, feel free to take advantage of this. Um, I think it can help people quite a bit. It just has to be considered upfront. Okay, so let's talk about HIPAA. I know you guys love HIPAA and waivers of authorization. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> nobody loves them. That's fine. Um, but let's talk about, um, and HIP is confusing. It's confusing for us in our office. It's complex. I'm always learning something new, but I tried to write this, this, this slide and the next one in kind of the most simple way that I can. So hopefully it makes some sense, but I am happy to talk through this for hours if you'd like to, <laughs> although at that point, I'm probably not going to be giving good answers. Um, okay. So when you're using data that is considered a PHI, and that means it touched the medical record, we have um, gotten really specific about what we consider PHI. And that means that at some point touched the medical record, meaning you either got it from the medical record or it will be put into the medical record. Um, so assuming that you are accessing or using PHI for research purposes, um, you are required to have either the, a written authorization from the patient or their LAR, or a waiver of authorization from a HIPAA privacy board, the IRB. The IRB acts as a HIPAA privacy board. So you have to have one of those two things. That's the general rule under HIPAA. But there's a number of exceptions. And this is where it gets hard. The general rule is easy, right? The exceptions is where it gets confusing. So the main exceptions that we see impacting research and, again, secondary use of data and recruitment and all of those activities are preparatory to research, use of decedent PHI for research, and um, honest broker. Don't quote me on the honest broker thing. This is my summary of it. This is like not from the regulations. Um, I'll talk about preparatory to research on the next slide. So I'll spend a second on honest broker here. So um, under the HIPAA privacy rule, an institution, probably a person, but let's say an institution can act as an honest broker to de-identify PHI to allow it to be used for research purposes. Pretty sure that's some of the activities that Regan's Truth does on a very regular basis. That has to happen under a BAA, under a business associate agreement. And as long as the people doing those activities, this is my interpretation, as long as the people doing those activities are not engaged in the research, you can be in that honest broker role. What you can't do is somebody who's on your research team is like, I'm going to be the honest broker. I'm going to de-identify the data. No, you're not the honest broker. You are a research team member accessing identifiable data. But if you are really providing a service external to the study team, that's where that honest broker concept and role comes into play. So you can serve as the honest broker, de-identify data, give it to researchers who are not, you know, you're not working with them on this except to serve in that role. And you are in one of those exceptions and you do not need either a written waiver or a written authorization or a waiver. So that's kind of a big one that I think we haven't ever really parsed through exactly how that works, particularly for Regan Street's activities. Um, and we can talk about that more if you'd like. Um, but let's talk about preparatory to research, because this is one that um, we spend a lot of time talking about with folks. So preparatory to research really helps us with research recruitment. And the question becomes, when can somebody access PHI for the purpose of recruiting or contacting a potential research subject to ask them if they want to be in the research or to collect feasibility data, but that's less interesting. We're going to talk about recruitment. So the preparatory to research provisions require that the PHI cannot leave the covered entity. That is the most important point, but that's kind of vague. Um, so you know, you have to go down another layer. So what it means to leave the covered entity is that that PHI is used or accessed by somebody who is not a member of the workforce of the covered entity. So all covered entities define their workforce in a particular way. Cover, that is the choice of the covered entity. That's why this gets complex. For example, IU Health has defined their workforce to include duly appointed IU, IU Health um, faculty, care providers who have dual appointments at both facilities and the individuals working directly under them in their supervision. So research coordinators who are IU staff who do not get a paycheck from IU Health and do not have an IU Health username, um, they are considered part of the workforce of IU Health for purposes of accessing PHI for recruitment for research studies because of the way that IU Health has defined their workforce. So this is not something, the reason it's complex is it's not something that we can just look to the regulations and get a black and white answer for every institution. Because you have to know some things about how that covered entity has defined their workforce and what their policies and practices are. So we know that for IU Health, you know, I was able to tell you, I actually 
don't know off the top of my head what Eskenazi's definition of their workforce is. It's an important question. I should know the answer to that. But these are the qu kinds of questions we need to be asking when we're not sure. So if we're not sure of that covered entities policy and those definitions, we need to go back to the compliance experts at that institution and make sure that we understand. And if we are allowing access to PHI for recruitment purposes by someone at that institution or somehow maybe affiliated with that institution, that they are a member of the workforce. If they aren't, that doesn't mean they can't have the data. What that means is the IRB needs to have granted a waiver of authorization for recruitment before that person accesses that data for recruitment purposes. I put a nice link here to um, an FAQ. It's short. Um, it's helpful. So if you want to learn more about this, check that out. But I'm also happy to answer questions because I know this is a hot issue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my question is about, so you said with IU Health that they, the way they define it, is it IU employees who are being supervised by the duly appointed yes. faculty member? So what about university affiliates? Because in many of our studies here, we have reentry staff who are serving as RAs, for example, um, and, and are not, you know, they're not getting a paycheck directly right. from IU, that they're getting it, you know, a, as an affiliate. So does that extend to affiliates is my question. That is a great question that I think we need to ask IU Health, because I am not sure if they have defined it beyond IU um, folks that are working under the direct supervision of the PI. So um, I will put that on my list to talk to Erica McDaniel at IU Health about, because we're talking about these issues all the time lately, and we'll get an answer for that one. I I have one additional yeah. question for related to that. So uh, typically, Regan Street staff are employed through subcontracts to the university. How mm -hmm. does the university define covered entity, and does that have implications for Shannon as well? Yeah, the university is um, complex. So the university is considered a hybrid covered entity under HIPAA. So there are only certain components of the university that are considered covered entities. They are the healthcare providing portions of the university. So certainly the health clinics on each campus, on um, the School of Dentistry, the School of Optometry. The School of Medicine um, does not directly bill for healthcare services, I do not believe. Um, so it, it gets very complex there in terms of how, whether or not IU would need to define their workforce. Um, so instead, because IU doesn't have their own medical records outside of those other facilities that I mentioned. So the access to the medical records is the access to IU Health medical records. So they are the relevant covered entity. So that's where we need to trace it back from. Is that individual who's a PI on the study an IU Health person? Um, you know, meaning do they get some money from IU Health? That's, you know, the most basic and simple way to think of it. Um, if so, then they're a member of the workforce of IU Health. And then at least the IU folks, I assume the Regan Street folks, but we'll check on that, who directly report to them and work under their supervision on those projects are a member of the workforce. But if you are not, say you came from the School of Nursing, hypothetically, um, you would not be a member of that workforce and you would need either an IU Health, under IU Health policy, you would need an IU Health affiliated co-investigator to work with you on that, or you would need a waiver of authorization. But again, we need to look back at IU Health policies regarding access to PHI and make sure we're also complying with those. So there's two layers. First layer is like comply with HIPAA. And I can comply with HIPAA by just giving you the waiver. I have to make sure the waiver criteria are met. I'm not just going to give you a waiver for any reason. But a lot of times people can justify all of those waiver criteria. That's the first layer, and that's the HIPAA compliance. And of course, that's important. You know, the OCR comes in to audit. Those are the things they want to see. But then there's an additional layer of the healthcare institutions' policies and procedures and whether we're following those. And they might layer some additional requirements on top of that in addition to having the waiver of authorization in place. Any other questions on this before we jump to another topic? Okay, uh, data sharing. So I wanted to briefly touch on this because it's kind of a hot topic in the IRB world, and I think in I think in the research world. Although I just really talk to IRB folks, um, but there's certainly a big increased emphasis on data sharing. This is being um, both in terms of sharing data back to participants on an individual results basis 
and in terms of broad data sharing and open science. So sharing results back to participants really kind of came, we knew about it naturally, but it really kind of became a major topic of conversation when the new common rule was published because there was a new requirement for communicating to subjects in the consent if there were going to be clinically relevant research results and whether or not those would be communicated back to subjects. So that's when the IRB started really kind of thinking critically about this. What does our role need to be? You know, how far do we need to go in requiring research teams to do types of analysis and communication that perhaps they aren't resourced or hadn't planned to do? So we spent a lot of time thinking about this about three years ago. And we have a lovely guidance, I think it's lovely, a guidance document on how to think about return of research results, individual return of research results, and how to plan that up front and how to communicate that in the consent to subjects. What's the more hot topic currently is um, broad data sharing or open science. So the NIH has a new policy on data management sharing plans. I'm getting my in the wrong order possibly, but the new NIH guidance that goes into effect um, in January. And there's a lot of other stuff happening in this arena. So it's really kind of happening whether people like it or not. So it's being driven by these regulatory requirements, publications. I'm hearing more and more folks say like, I'm not going to be able to publish an X, Y, or Z journal unless I agree to make my data available in this way or on this particular platform. I think there's been a perception um, from the IRB world, but also from the research world, that IRBs are the barrier to this, that IRBs do not want data shared. Um, because we are concerned with big data and confidentiality, and that concern is also increasing, you know, in our world generally today. Um, but I think the, the real root of it is not that IRBs, particularly not our IRB, I can speak for our IRB. Our IRB does not want to block or limit sharing. We just haven't done the hard work of figuring out how to describe that to subjects. So right now we're talking about studies that have consent where you have an opportunity to tell people what you plan to do with their data, but that's just really hard to do, right? It's hard to describe in lay language how you're gonna share this data, who it might be accessible to, to actually explain the risks of that because there are risks, but it's my personal opinion that a lot of subjects that sign up for these studies would accept those risks. They would still be in those studies. They just wanna know. They want to be told up front, this is where my data may go. And the vast majority of them, yeah, that might be an overstatement. There are a lot of research studies that subjects participate in because they want that data used as broadly as it can be to answer the research questions. That is one of their motivations for being in that study is to find answers to the question you are asking. Whether you find the answer or another researcher finds the answer, I don't think subjects generally care much. They want somebody to find the answer and improve things. So I think subjects are largely in favor of data sharing, of course, not across the board. But if we can explain that to them, and that's the hard work the IRB needs to do is figure out what we want this language to look like in consent forms. I think it really is something that can be um, expanded upon. It should not be an issue or a problem. So it's something that we're kind of talking about and thinking about a lot. Um, we're engaging in all sorts of working groups. We're working with um, the folks um, at IU libraries around the um, NIH policy and information that we want to push out guidance for what this needs to look like in NIH proposals. We're working on drafting that better consent language to explain this data sharing, but it's really something we're looking to promote, not looking to discourage or restrict in any way. Okay, that is it for my hodgepodge. Um, if you had a question that I didn't address, please let me know what it is. I, uh, some of it, I was like, I'll just talk about that. I didn't put it on a slide. So if I missed something, let me know or any other questions. Are there, do I need to see if there's in the chat? Okay. I don't know if I can see them up here. Who's that? Sorry. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes. I would love, yes, please email me. Eskenazi's definition of the workforce, if you can, I would love that. I didn't put my contact info on this slide, but uh, Patty has it. So Patty can send that to me as well. This is a general question, not a practical question. So I apologize to those who are here for practical purposes, but, um, but, but you spent some time talking about the IRB and what it is and yeah. sort of its mission and stuff. So that's what this is. Um, about not how to do something. Um, you, you know, you said you're 
IRBs in general, I'm not speaking about this one in particular, you know, are here to sort of not just protect institutions, but protect people and these yeah. kinds of things. Um, and, and I think, you know, I've heard some sort of discussions about, you know, what our IRBs do, legitimate critiques of them, as well as, you know, suggestions for what they might do. Um, and I was struck by sort of the moments where we don't need to come to the IRB. And again, mm -hmm. not just this IRB, but really any IRB. Yeah. You know, and so you, you put up a slide and you showed us, you know, living people. And, and that made me think about other kinds of research, right? If we're digging up bones um, inspired by the recent Nobel Prize winners and we want to, you know, find things in, you know, someone's thumb, but the thumb is of a dead person and it's on a Native American reservation. If we're going to devise a new method to extract gas from the ground, ground or build a new nuclear bomb, like all these kinds of things. Um, these do happen usually within communities and, and oftentimes um, um, certainly affect people. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of people have things to say about them, but it often seems like IRBs are silent. And, and, and that's not a critique or a criticism or a problem. Um, that, but I do think that indicates that IRBs are there for legal compliance, which ultimately you know, is for the institution. And if we have to ask questions about ethical research beyond that, yeah. we either need one of two things. We need to do that in another venue, or we need an IRB that truly doesn't see itself as just there for compliance purposes. Um, one that has, you know, all kinds of stakeholders involved in it, not just, you know, lawyers, right, experts in compliance, nothing yeah. wrong with law, right? Uh, but um, but so that's just my sort of thinking about this, you know, and as this is sort of an interesting IRB that talks about not just how to comply, but what it is and what and has seems to have like ethical aspirations. Um, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, is the place to think about ethical research an IRB or is that the place for compliance and then you know, a different part of the institution or a different group of people are there then to ask, well, now that we've complied, how do we actually do good? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, IRBs were given a very narrow charge. Um, an even less interesting example that drives me nuts on an almost daily basis is you can do nearly the exact same thing, the exact same thing, and just say, I'm not going to share the data with anybody. And then it doesn't require any sort of review. Um, so the hospital can say, we want to change our practice. We want to do something experimental. I'm not saying they would, but they can. They can say, I want to do something experimental. I have no idea if it will help patients. If you're not touching an FDA regulated product, you know, and, and kind of randomizing or doing anything like that, if it's not FDA regulated, you can do that. And you can say, but I'm just going to do it here. I'm not going to tell anybody else about it. I'm not going to publish. I'm not going to disseminate that information. And it requires no review. Um, so we get a lot of quality improvement where we spend all sorts of time thinking about, is this quality improvement? Is this research? Does it trigger the need for review? And that doesn't mean there's not ethical concerns with it. There may be. Um, a lot of folks think that the disciplines themselves should kind of bear that ethical responsibility, that we don't need IRBs overseeing it. IRBs were um, dreamt up, if you will, because of a very specific set of problems and circumstances that occurred with human subjects research. Um, and so that's kind of what the driving force has been. I won't go into the history. I'm sure everybody knows at least some of it. Um, and so I think that informs kind of the scope of, of what we do. But the institution is certainly thinking about this, not in terms of expanding the scope of the IRB, but on kind of the other end. So our research misconduct office is responsible for a very specific set of things that go wrong in research. Um, falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism, right? But there's a lot of other bad things that can happen in research that don't have a home along the lines of what you're talking about. If it's not IRB non-compliance, it's not a research integrity issue, it's not IACUC non-compliance, who handles those issues? They're real issues that happen in research and are problematic for the institution, problematic for researchers, and they don't have a home. So there's been a lot of discussion in the research compliance world and even in our research integrity office specifically around this concept of what's being called detrimental research practices and who handles those issues for the institution. So um, it's great questions and interesting stuff to think about. There was a question on chat asking if anyone knows how the VA defines workforce. The VA defines engagement and research differently than other entities. So the VA is in some ways um, less complex because they're very specific about when something engages the VA. So any use of VA resources, facilities, patients, or time, investigator time doing research is considered to engage the VA. And then in terms of, so that's kind of simple. 
And then in terms of whether or not a waiver of authorization is required, they do not apply the preparatory to research provisions to research recruitment. So if you are going in the EMR at the VA to get patient information for purposes of recruiting there, you are always required to have a waiver of authorization. Additionally, they have their systems kind of so locked down and nobody can get access to them that you have to have a VA appointment to get in there. So we don't have some of these complexities. They don't share their data. They don't let anybody in there. Everybody has to have a waiver. So it's pretty straightforward at the VA. So to answer the question specifically, no, I do not know how they have defined their workforce, but I also don't need to know for applying the, these rules. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Kirk Crocky. Um, quick question. There used to be this gray zone, and I think you maybe have addressed it about people used to say, well, if people are just doing quality improvement projects in the hospital, um, that's really just quality improvement. Um, is your recommendation and actually requirement that if you intend to publish that quality improvement, you should still get a exempt status from the IRB? I know it's quite simple, but is yeah. the general rule, if you're going to publish, have the IRB weigh in on it, even if it's exempt? Yes, my general rule is if you intend to publish, you should come talk to us. I would not automatically put you in the exempt category. Right. Um, I think there are situations where it may still be determined to be non-human subjects research, but getting that documentation for our office is important because you're probably going to get asked somewhere down the road to produce that documentation. So you may as well just get it up front. And that gives us a good opportunity to have the conversation about whether it's non-research quality improvement or whether it crosses that line into research. So yes, please come talk to us if you plan to publish or disseminate outside the institution, even if you think it's quality improvement. Could you clarify one thing on that? That's where I'm confused. So if you're doing things with patients and you're doing quality improvement, and how, how is it ever non-human subjects research? I mean, that's a technicality I don't fully understand. Yeah, so it's that first prong of the definition, whether it is a systematic investigation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. So even if you have those living individuals about whom you are interacting or intervening or collecting information, that's just one half of the definition. You also have to have a systematic investigation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. So what folks argue, I think correctly, is under the regulations, if you don't ever send that information anywhere. There is no hope of it ever contributing to generalizable knowledge. Therefore, by definition, you are not conducting human subjects research, leaving aside the many ethical concerns with what you may be doing and a lack of oversight. But, you know, that's for another day. And Dr. Kronke could probably speak to that much better than I could anyway. <laughs> No, 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 because that, that question has come up among a lot of clinicians, you know, that are doing quality improvement. And I'm, I still think I'm hearing from you, if you intend to publish, which is then systematic sharing with the scientific community, you should get the IRB to weigh in on it. So you could have a sentence in your paper, this was deemed exempt by the IUIRB. Right? Correct. Okay. Correct. That's helpful. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Randy Grout. Um, I just uh, was just texting with Patty, and uh, we got the PHI or the workforce policy. Um, I pasted it in the chat, and I will follow up with the exact definition. I I can't interpret it, but I can copy and paste it. <laughs> Excellent. I feel like I will feel the same way when I read it, but that is a step in the right direction, right? No, that's really helpful. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, that'd be great. Randy, can you read it out loud or do you want Lou Guy to read it? Randy, can you read it out loud? Um, sure. Um, it says <laughs> EHI, PHI, EH, PHI policy defines workforce, physicians, providers, employees, trainees, volunteers, and other persons whose conduct in the performance of work for Eskenazi Health is under direct control of Eskenazi Health, whether or not they are paid by Eskenazi Health. Um, um, I, if I were to read that, I, my questions would be, is my conduct in performance of work for Eskenazi Health or not? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that may need some follow-up. Yeah, great question. We can ask Renee maybe to <laughs> make a decision for us. We are working on an MOU between IU and Eskenazi that may define some of these terms. So um, Patty is well aware of um, kind of our where we're at with that, but we probably need to revisit that 
works that will help us to define some of these things. Any other questions? I just want to echo back to your comments at the beginning about the culture of the IRB, because I, I don't think everyone necessarily appreciates how special and unique that is, that we actually have an IRB that is um, focused on working and collaborating and supporting the work um, rather than trying to prevent or restrict or inhibit. And that really comes through in the interactions that um, I personally had with the IRB around some complicated issues with external partners. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted to uh, say thank you for that, for fostering that culture. And I will tell you, people who are new the to the institution, when they start to ask questions about submitting, and I say, oh, you should just call the IRB. They're really helpful. They always look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> um, but it is very true. Um, I have found your team consistently supportive and helpful in working through this with the ultimate goal of, of ensuring that the work can move forward in a way that's protective of the participants and um, compliance. So I am great, grateful for that, deeply appreciative, and just wanted to elevate how special that is and how fortunate we are to have um, an office that is so collaborative. So thank you. Thank you. I will come downtown any day to hear stuff like that. We have another question. Yeah. Um, Monica Deck asks, what is the policy for keeping or removing people from the IRB if they are no longer actively working on a project? So if somebody is no longer actively working on a project, they should technically be removed, but there's not a requirement that they be removed unless they've left the institution. If your PI leaves the institution and they're still listed as PI, that is obviously a problem. We need a new person listed. Um, if your research assistant or if you're a research assistant and you're leaving, is it vitally important that you be removed? Nah, you can do that with your next amendment. I'm not super worried about that. Now, if you were the only, you know, say it's a study in pharmacology and it's looking at cardiac effects of a drug or something, and you had one cardiologist on your study and your cardiologist leaves, you need to replace that cardiologist because you need somebody who can do that activity. Those are the kinds of things we think about, not like, did this person leave three months ago and they're still listed on there? Randy Grout just had a comment. He said he wanted to thank you and your team uh, for your flexibility in triage and prioritization. Uh, most things he submits are not in a rush, but the times when he does, he really appreciates the responsiveness he's experienced. Yeah, that's a great point. We do our best to accommodate that kind of stuff. You know, we know that sometimes you get something last minute, you know, you don't know about it. You accidentally forgot to hit the submit button when you thought you did it two weeks ago, that kind of stuff happens. Um, we're people too. So we get it. Just reach out to us. We do everything we can to accommodate um, those kinds of requests. And, you know, we also have urgent things that come up because a patient needs treatment. We will drop everything to do that. We can convene an IRB meeting usually in less than a day if we need to for an urgent treatment situation. So, you know, if that's just happening all the time, we won't be able to always accommodate it, but um, that's, that's important to us to be able to help folks in that way. So please let us know if you ever need that kind of help. Any more questions either in person or online? Beth, thank you so much for coming in person and for your presentation and answering our questions. And to everyone who was here um, in person, just so those of you at home know that we had sandwiches from Jimmy John's and chips. And Randy, uh, not Randy, um, Brian has guaranteed <laughs> that one of those sandwiches has the golden ticket. So I'm just so you know, it's there. Okay, and I, let me, I would also like to thank um, Cameron who helped set up the reel and did a, all the organizing of it and will continue to do that. And to Mungai who takes care of our technology. So thanks both of you very much.